Welcome to the Tabletop Gaming Guild podcast. The Tabletop Gaming Guild is all about the experiences and memories that playing board games with friends and family can create. On this episode, we have Mike from Eternal Realms here, and we're going to talk about his Kickstarter, Wizard and Relics. Welcome, Mike. Hey, thanks so much, James. It's an absolute honor to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic. And uh, yeah, I'm Mike. I uh, launched my first Kickstarter, um, I guess now last year, <laughs> in November 2020. But uh, yeah, my, my first card game, Wizards and Relics. We, uh, yeah, scraped by and funded on Kickstarter, and here we are. Yeah, we did a review video on uh, Wizard and Relics, or actually a preview video, and I like the game a lot. Do you want to give a little spiel about the game? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's a uh, it's pretty light card game. It's a dueling game, sort of based on the foundation of uh, of War, that classic old silly card game that totally sucks, <laughs> but you kind of want to play it for some reason. You just, uh, it's random, but yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a fast-paced, magical multiplayer dueling card game, and and, you know, I'm a Magic the Gathering player, and uh, I love the, the dueling games, the one-on-ones, but uh, this game is actually two to four players, and it plays really well at three and four players. You're all kind of simultaneously dueling together. But, uh, yeah, I love Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, and so naturally, it's I'm just, I love magical things, so it just, it's just got to be wizards. But yeah, it's just a pretty simple card game you could bring home for Christmas. Yeah, I like to say, too, that when I played it, there's a lot of depth to it, too, because of the different levels of the wizards and stuff, so I like that a lot. I also like that... Uh, I could see the uh, Lord of the Rings sort of like influence in it. And some of the promo cards were really cool. I like the, uh, what is it? The Zemilio one, <laughs> summoned one. Uh, Cause I like that little rune worker placement game. The little, it's, they have like, a, it's a 14 card worker placement game. That's a lot of fun. So I thought that was really cool to have a promo card in there. Yeah. Yeah. Zemilio is awesome guy. I, uh, yeah, I can't wait to play his game. I'm kind of jealous of you. You got, got some copies of that action. Yeah. It's actually uh, for being only like a, a handful of cards. There's a lot of strategy in it. Uh, for that game, what you're going to be doing is play, you have three meeples that you can put down, which have a specific name, but we're going to call them three meeples. And you have uh, pattern cards with different runes on it and you have to make a decision. You're either going to place a rune card down to increase the area that you have allotted, or you're going to place one of your meeples down. If you place a card down, you get another card. If you place a meeple down, you don't get another card. So where it gets really cool is, is you start with three cards and you have two cards and then you have one card. So the pool of options to diminishes as you start deploying your people yeah. down for your area so it becomes a really cool tug of war between the two players because i don't want to put my piece down too early and give you the opportunity to, to make a larger area for yourself so that was a really cool game i liked it a lot you should definitely try it oh yeah i i backed uh, his kickstarter i that sounds awesome i'm i'm super jealous of that because as a first-time creator i almost should have had a simpler cheaper you know, <laughs> smaller game and so just having a micro game like that i just i would love to design one that sounds super fun and cost effective too <laughs> your game's nice and portable it's not gigantic yeah yeah so, yep, it's, it's, it's on the smaller end for sure yep. yeah we even trimmed it down i think the base set was at least 100 more cards i think it was 250 um we trimmed it down to 120 and so yeah we we did a little bit of that like it's been to uh how was your uh design process throughout before the kickstarter even like when you first started how long did it take you to get your idea and uh, start designing it yeah that's a great question this guy's been in the works for a couple of years now and you know it, it honestly the idea kind of just hit me one day and then i just ran with it and over a course of a summer we just got this thing turned and realized that we had something i uh so i'm an artist and illustrator and i uh i'm kind of a, a one entrepreneur i like i want to come up with a thing and do right i want to i'm always coming up with different projects i've published like coloring books and and uh and different things and i was looking for the next thing but i, I was in the process of like building a story and creating a wordless picture book actually and like creating this whole world and then i had a, a meeting with a friend he, we were coming up with like just like different ideas in life and different things or projects we could uh, move forward on and one of his things was a card game and i like never thought i could make a card game it never crossed my mind to make a board game or card game but he just like had this little idea because we played you know probably i don't know exploiting kittens or some game like the last weekend like, oh maybe we can make a game <laughs> And I was like, what the heck? I was like, all of a sudden this light bulb went off. Like, I could make a game. I like love cards, man. I played cards so much growing up, played magic. I designed my own magic scent and printed it off at a job I worked. I'm not like a super gamer, but uh, I like, you know, I, I like, I get, I get into card games a lot. I just am obsessed with magic. But yeah, anyway, I like all of a sudden it like dawned on me. And after like 30 years of life, all of a sudden I like had permission to make a card game. The idea just kind of sprang to me in a moment and I wrote it down at work 
work. And uh, it was the, I always thought of the game of war. I just I liked the concept of that, of playing a card face down uh, without your opponent knowing what it is. And then you want the higher power. But like, how could we make it more strategic? And this idea came, well, why don't you lay two cards down? And uh, I've been told by play tester, a couple play testers that it's kind of like Wizards and Relics harnesses like the power of two card combos or like the fun of two card combos. And I'm like, oh, I didn't really think of that until later on. But um, yeah, like what if you had a war, but you actually had a deck of cards? Sometimes you draft or maybe you can go random if you want a quicker game. And what if you could choose which cards you lay and there's two and then maybe they have different abilities and they could interact with other things. And so then, yeah, it kind of began. And I got some buddies who, you know, we played Magic together in other other games and they came over and we just started going to town. And we have, yeah, just, just ran with it. And it like the more people we played with, the more people, were like hey this is actually cool and i for the longest time i couldn't find a single game and maybe you guys can help me out with this that like was like it i've now heard of a few games that are in the same vein but i know and have played almost zero games that are quite like it and uh, so it was hard to put like it in a genre you know we kept comparing it to what's the munchkin but it's not it's not munchkin at all but it like yeah it, it was hard to kind of dial in but yeah i we realized we had a game and we kept going and then i'm like well what what if this could be a thing how can we make it more so then i began the, the long process of figuring out <laughs> how to how to get a game um yeah produced manufactured and funded and uh become a thing so that's kind of the beginning of it so you said that you're an artist as well did you illustrate all the cards yeah yeah i love the illustrations i think they're fantastic oh thank you so much if i came out of the womb with like just one skill my natural skill is like drawing with a pencil that's like the one skill i was born with everything else i had to like figure out (laughs) and practice but uh i obviously had to practice that too but yeah it took a lot of time but and it's not even my like actual art style i my main art style is like abstract ink work uh because you know just finding references and drawing people it's that's hard work but yeah i uh found a style and i yeah illustrated and designed the whole thing oh i just think of that abstract ink game if you can figure that out would be oh <laughs> get to work on that okay yeah yeah I, i've got a game in the future that could work. <laughs> also had a i also had a design related question before we hop too far ahead i was curious to know if there was anything that if there was any nugget of the game that you started with that made it through to the end and also was there any like darlings left on the cutting room floor oh yeah for sure absolutely so you're saying the first part of that question was if there was something that that made it through the end you're, you're asking like what made it through and then what got cut yeah um <laughs> Let's let's see. Just just one thing. We don't need a laundry list. Yeah. Oh man, that's a great question. You know, a lot of of course, a lot of the actual cards. You know, once you start coming up with abilities and cards, it just it gets so fun, and then you have this giant pool. Um. So as far as like specific cards and abilities, we had to cut like every everything. We trimming it down to the most simple, the best simplified version of the game was so challenging. That took it took so long. Like literally it took like two years of us like going back to the drawing board and we'd we'd come up with this oh let's add in this let's add in this and then all of a sudden like power inflation happens and the game is different and the the average power level rises and there's these crazy combos and then my friend who's not like as much of a gamer he's like what are you what are you doing what happened (laughs) then then we ended up like cutting or moving all that aside and so i think that's That was the hardest thing, but I think one element that we almost didn't have, which actually makes the game now, is what what we call the shrine cards, and they weren't in it at first. And so with the shrine cards, it's kind of this neutral environment card that every round it'll affect the game. It'll give a different attribute or power to different types of wizard cards, and uh, it kind of guides the game. But we didn't have it for a long time. I felt like the game was good, but it felt like a little more random. I kind of wanted to get this Texas Hold'em poker effect or this kind of I want I wanted to be able to read off people like how can we read and be able to like have an educated guess what wizards they'll play because the game has kind of this rock paper scissors Pokemon type of thing where you know certain wizards have advantage uh, you know like blue has advantage over red and red over green etc and yeah so the game was kind of a, like a you know, I was like a six or seven out of ten I felt like it was like the game was okay it was good but yeah until a friend finally mentioned like yeah it's just a little too random like how about you have a card that gives 
moves, abilities each round or whatever. I'm like, oh, but we do. But we thought that that would be like an expansion thing. So we added that to the game and then it like, it just made it, it just brought it all together. Yeah, what I was going to say is uh, I played a lot of like lane combat games, uh, card games. Mm. One of the biggest ones is, uh, I had to, I had to Google it because I forgot what the name was, is uh, Warhammer Age of Sigurmeyer Champions. It was a CCG style, uh, I think it's still in existence, style lane combat game. Okay. But the uh, thing I didn't like about that game was the CCG portion of it. So mm. the decks weren't balanced. And there's some way over power cards. What I liked about your game a lot is that you have a common pool of cards, but they're separated by rarity, like three different levels. And you have your wizards and your relics. And I like the fact that you have a set number of each of those that you get to make your deck. So when you're playing, you know how many of each type the other person has. I like the fact that you can't go in thinking you're going to win every combat. Mm -hmm. You have to go in thinking, oh, Peter really wants to win this one. So I should probably throw my wizard away like a low level Mm -hmm. wizard. I like that a lot. And the shrines in there were nice too because I could use that because I'm like looking at their face and they're all excited. I'm like, well, yeah, they got an advantage. So I did like that a lot more in the game. So my question really was, where did you come in with the idea of setting up a common deck where you set up and you separate it into the uh, the three different rarities and then how did you figure out like the mixture that you were going to do with those? Yeah. So as a magic player, I like feel like it has to be a deck. You know, everything has to be a deck. <laughs> and, like I had the suggestion before, you know, some of these more casual quick to play games have just one center deck and I would love to have a game that has that. But even though the setup time is incredibly important, you know, I want this to be be sort of a hybrid casual game or a game that a gamer can play with like their family or their kids or whatever but i i still had to have it and to me drafting and deck building is just so fun so this game actually started as a draft started as like a drafting game my intention was man you would draft these cards and then you would build your deck and play it but we found out just from the nature maybe even just play testing but we almost always played it by randomly shuffling out the cards and then just playing and getting into it and we realized well that might be the common way to play the game for you know more casual people it's a lot quicker you can get it rolling but to the rarity thing early on there was the biggest complaint was some people had glorious decks yeah and some people (laughs) just got shuffled crappy cards and that was a problem that was a serious problem and uh it got suggested like well how do we fix this you know what if we had a rarity so like well it's not a collectible card game but maybe that could work so we slapped on a rarity system and and so we could balance out the decks every time and to ensure like the most balance that we could help you know make it gameplay that there uh, that there could be so it, it seemed to work great the only problem is it slows down the uh, the beginning the setup a little bit yeah so so i think that's one area that i feel like wow what how could we improve that but yeah we wanted to balance the game and um that's kind of that yeah i like that a lot i didn't see, i have never seen that sort of idea where you do that sort of setup and mm-hmm. i liked it a lot that it worked really well and technically what we did we set it up and then we would play the decks a couple times and then we'd swap them mm-hmm and then play them again so we didn't have to reset it up but yeah. eventually we'd reset it up again but it seemed really well balanced just with that so I thought that was amazing oh nice awesome that's great to hear that's good to hear we did that too where we would keep the decks but we found out eventually you know there's some cards I don't know if you encountered them much where you you know you take you're taking cards from other people's decks or hands and keeping them so the decks it would yeah. end up after a few rounds a little lopsided but yeah that's definitely a great way to do it without having to reset up we just wrote those down <laughs> so we oh can... really oh yeah, so, man that's next so, I love it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So one of the things I'm really interested in is the process that you took to get to Kickstarter and what worries you had right before you launched. I had a lot of those. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, in a few days before launch, I was told by someone who is pretty, I guess, a prominent, well-known figure in the community. And he told me like, oh, I like your game. You got a gem. But he's like, I've, n- I've never heard of you until today. Like, uh, you you, you got to delay your campaign and you got to lower your funding goal. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, you can't, you got to take everything with a grain of salt. Uh, but I, I was cross-referencing his advice with some other people and like, man, and it, it seemed like probably pretty good advice. But for me, I like knew if it's going to happen, I just got to, I got to do this thing. I got, we got to launch, like we got to do this and figure it out. And, and uh, yeah, so I, I launched with probably not the ideal audience that I had hoped to have and probably a smaller email list than I would have wished and, uh, and all that stuff. But, but yeah, we, uh, we brought it, brought it across 
crossed the finish line. But leading up to that, building the audience and launching on Kickstarter, to be honest, I had never used Kickstarter before. So a few, definitely many months before, I started digging in, looking at projects, started backing projects, and kind of getting involved and interested in, in what else is going on and, and familiarize myself with, with, uh, with the whole deal. But yeah, I, I wasn't a Kickstarter user beforehand, so it was all fresh. It was all new. Like I said, we'd been developing the game for a couple of years, and so I slowly was building an audience. Slowly had a few local events. I had a Facebook group I started building. Very light on Instagram. <laughs> a little, you know, a lot more on my personal Facebook and started collecting emails and uh, building an audience, but uh, nothing terribly impressive. So yeah, uh, building up to Kickstarter. It kept on getting pushed back and delayed and, you know, we had trimmed down our base set. And so I felt like that process of building a game, polishing it, play testing it took a long time. Uh, we went to a few conventions, uh, all in Minnesota, all local, and they were always awesome. It was fun to play test with, with people and everyone was always super stoked and like, can I buy your game? And uh, which is just so humbling and honoring to hear. But like, well, well, no, I mean, this is just a prototype. Like, no, we don't we don't even <laughs> yeah, we're not even close. So that kind of drove us to, to keep moving forward. But yeah, leading up to a Kickstarter. Yeah, I, I had to learn learn the ropes there. And by the time we went go, man, I was doing everything wrong. I, you know, I didn't have a big enough audience. I did not have enough followers on my pre-launch page. I actually, I had just started the uh, the business for my, you know, publishing company or my company because uh, I wanted to run, you know, I wanted to have it set up right with the business bank account and everything. And, and but I, <laughs> I set that up and then tried to set up my Kickstarter. And so Stripe wasn't verifying my business was real because it hadn't gotten entered in the system yet. So everything, all that stuff got delayed. And my pre-launch page was up just less than a week before launch. And you're supposed to have that sucker running for weeks, you know, to get people engaged, get the, the pre-launch followers. So Kickstarter shoots them an email. So I was doing everything wrong. And, uh, you know, I just started running some Instagram giveaways just to get a more audience. And I, I was trying to do all the Facebook ads myself and just... Yeah, it was it was ragtag. But yeah, we launched and we, you know, we got about a third of the funding on the first day. And we yeah, we kind of just kept on powering through. And uh, so yeah, leading up to Kickstarter was kind of a shit show, kind of uh, kind of all over the place. <laughs> but but we did it. And I felt in my heart that we had to just go for it and see what happens. You had me sweating for a little while <laughs> when I was watching the campaign. Uh, mm. But yeah, I mean, like, I think that all the graphic art and the videos that you put on your campaign campaign page. I think that really helped out a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We ended up getting a project we love before it even launched or went live. And uh, I've, I was told, you know, that was, you know, it just looked like a solid campaign, which I suck at a lot of things, but it, I can at least like make something look good if I spend yeah. enough time on it. So that's the one thing we had going. And James, when did you discover the campaign? Or I believe it was like after your first weekend. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That was some stressful times after that week, first weekend. <laughs> <That> was, <laughs> yeah. I was really sweating bullets on if we would, if you would fund. And I, that first week I was, you know, I was hustling, doing everything I could. And then it all kind Kind of, I uh, I had taken quite a few days off of work, and then the day that I was supposed to come back to work, my whole family had to be quarantined, and I was just not feeling like I wanted to do anything. I'd gotten sick, and uh, literally went five days without doing a single thing, which just was so stressful because at that time I honestly didn't know if we were gonna fund, so I was scrambling to after that to optimize my uh, my targeted Facebook ads and just connecting with people on Instagram, and uh, yeah, thankfully people like you come in, you. We were able to get you a copy. You put out some awesome content, and uh, it was beautiful. Your video is phenomenal, and I I'm right. always amazed when uh, when when you guys and other people, other influencers, can like get a game that uh, people that I've never met and that I haven't explained the game to, they can get a game, they can figure out the rules, and they can teach the rules as if they invented them. I just it's absolutely incredible. So like great work. You you did a good job. Thanks. I, I was gonna definitely give you hats off because you had all that going against you. We had COVID, so I mean not sure whether people are going to be throwing money at anything and you still funded and you had a decent goal too so yeah. that's awesome yeah so grateful
people. It, it was really funny because on Thanksgiving, I was like, all right, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to really just, I'm going to make brunch here in the morning. You know, we're going to just have a nice, relaxing Thanksgiving day. Our Thanksgiving was a little weirder because we were still kind of under quarantine, but we had a, we still had a nice Thanksgiving at home. But uh, I, I was going to chill out that day a little bit and take it easy. But then like all of a sudden we just kept getting backers and backers. And then we were actually close to funding. So we ended up funding on Thanksgiving and I was planning on relaxing that day, but no, it, we, uh, it was wild. It was amazing. But uh, yeah, we ended up funding funding on Thanksgiving Day. It was funny to hear the advice like, ah, you know, it's just like, don't expect too much during the holidays. Like, it's, you know, you'll probably get a lull. <laughs> and then it went nuts. But, uh, but yeah, we, we ended up pulling through and funding and uh, I did a lot of DMing on Instagram and uh, a lot of just connecting with people and think, yeah, it's just kind of slowly built momentum and I'm so grateful for that. It's, uh, yeah, it's really humbling to, to see the project through and see people resonate with this crazy game that I just, you know, made a couple of years ago that popped into my brain and out onto a little piece of paper and some scratch paper that, you know, went into a went into a sleeve with magic cards in the back and we just stinked around. So yeah, it's just crazy that people would be interested in it and want to support it. So it was crazy, crazy ride. I never understood like Thanksgiving Black Friday week with Kickstarter because mm. like that's the last place that I'm looking for doing stuff. Yeah. But for some reason it worked. It's just crazy. I think it was a magical timing of we were getting close to fun to anyway and then some people were like oh well you know we gotta hop in and my like yep. top tier where you could get yourself drawn as a wizard there's only a few of those left so i think people were trying to hop in on those two or upgrade their pledge so it kind of was magic so i i don't know you know if thanksgiving would look the same for anyone else or for if we had a different campaign but yeah it's really like the uh that master wizard tier so i really liked when you did that because i like you said you got a pretty good response for that i think that's just like an awesome idea yeah it's so fun to see people actually actually pledge money <laughs> for yeah. that and uh yeah it, it's pretty wild and yeah they all got backed and yeah it <laughs> we were only gonna do one <laughs> at first one or maybe even three max and uh and then we like realized we had 12 slots and hours and sweat off my back so like hey it seems like fun so let's give it a shot so yeah i'm glad you, it worked it's fun to hear that you got all of them back too right all 12 slots i think yes yep. yeah that's pretty cool so for your next game do you think you're going to be putting it on kickstarter oh man that's a good question why do you ask that just because i'm mean <laughs> <laughs> Do you have objections to Kickstarter, James? No, not particularly. Uh, it's a fine platform. Uh, it's just one of those things like you have like a uh, publishing company name now, Eternal Realms, mm. and Kickstarter does take a decent percentage mm. to Kickstarter it on there. So some people use uh, Kickstarter for a while and then start publishing. Some publishers use Kickstarter forever. Yeah. So it's just a it's just a thing that interests me because um, I mean you are paying Kickstarter. Yep. You are yep. taking some of your profit away, uh, and then from your experience and stuff is that worth going back in uh because you do have a, a built-in audience on kickstarter so. yeah it's a fascinating question i and yeah now with like game found or they're kind of you know moving up and trying to be another crowdfunding platform too and uh and we're using them as a pledge manager so oh that'd be kind of fun to have uh your crowdfunding platform and pledge manager in the same go <laughs> but uh no it's a great question i think i do plan on using kickstarter again i do want to get away from it i um i would i would like to release stuff on my own terms into my own audience uh, first, we got to build that build that audience. Um, but I would love to go direct to consumer and direct to my peeps. Uh, absolutely. But I figured out Kickstarter. I feel like I learned it. And there is enough of um, more audience building and, and kind of a marketing tool that I think I will use Kickstarter for the next game. I, next year, I, would, I hope to launch after Wizards and Relics gets in people's hands. I would love to launch the expansion, the next expansion to it, and uh, and open it up to international shipping. We we did a USA only campaign, which again I kind of screwed up <laughs> in how I set it up. We have a lot of people that kind of sneak through, and and uh, so I'm I really want to dial in the international shipping, and then kind of have uh, open up the campaign for uh, an expansion, and give Kickstarter another round of okay. Now I think I kind of know how what I'm doing a little bit better, and uh, and try to go 
go from there. Yeah, moving forward, I would love to to get off get off the platform. I was actually really worried about the Kickstarter audience not jiving with my audience because I want to target people that are maybe a little more casual or maybe people that are just more like Harry Potter fans that don't play that many games or you know not as heavy gamers. So I was a little bit like concerned about the audience in Kickstarter like really grilling me as a first time creator or as like they want all of these expectations because there's so many publishers that produce so much value right and I feel like I, can, I can't offer that much like monetary value I can't be offering you know, all these minis and all this stuff like there's so many things I don't know and I don't want to goof up <laughs> this whole deal you know I want to be able to, to manufacture a game and actually get it to people and so I don't want to 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 get goofed on the finances and, and all that stuff so I feel like I had to be really conservative so I was honestly really worried that I'd be get a ton of criticism or I'd have a bunch of people that were just not jiving with what I was doing but actually it was overwhelmingly positive like a lot of people were on board and really the only criticism I got was that it was USA only shipping so that was nice <laughs> so so I yeah. like a little more warmed up like okay I can find some cool people on Kickstarter and so maybe yeah so I think I'm going to use it for the next time I said I think the uh, Kickstarter audience overall is very positive for most of the Kickstarter campaigns I do have some exceptions on the Kickstarter campaigns the Simon ones are very caustic mm. those groups are very angry Oof. why are you backing the game <laughs> yeah <laughs> I don't get it. But uh, yeah, overall, like look at the different campaigns, especially uh, on the startup ones, people seem to be generally nice mm. and supportive. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah, you uh, don't see cool. too many negative comments unless there's a good reason. Mm. Well, you should see the Simon ones. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got to check those out. I was curious about your your reward structure. How did you go about deciding the uh, the Kickstarter bonuses, the the reward unlocks and Here's. all those cool things? Are you talking about about uh, the tiers and the uh, like stretch goals or the whole yeah work. yeah so I, I wanted to keep it as simple as possible just overall and not get over my head and uh, so as far as our tiers go you know just very straightforward I want it to be mostly just the game. So we had the game, then we had kind of two two upgrades to that that were not necessarily physical thing upgrades, but they were upgrades that were just unique to coming in at the ground floor. You could get your name, you know, written in on the map. You could, you know, be a patron of Ralzaria, the world that Wizards and Relics is in, or you can get drawn as a wizard. So the tiers were very straightforward. Um, but yeah, for stretch goals, that I was sweating bullets over this because I'm not that familiar with Kickstarter, and I see all these other campaigns with these sweet stretch goals i'm like dear lord like uh, like the manufacturing and getting the mold for a mini like oh that is insane and like all this stuff like i just don't know how many people are gonna back i and it was terrifying and you know there's technically like you don't have to do them but they engage the audience and so i was just trying to learn about all this stuff and it was it was terrifying at first i'm like i don't know and there's so many options and, and all this stuff so i had uh, luckily I've, I've met some people in the industry um it's an, it's an amazing industry there's so many cool peeps like yourself and uh, that are willing to help help and, and give input and so I was just able to get advice I, a lot of different advice but like I looked at some other campaigns that did kind of these daily unlocks and I'm like okay well, I like that because they're not tied to anything because I honestly don't know what we're gonna you know what we're gonna fund what's gonna really happen here so I, I kind of I, I rebranded as magical mysteries and I didn't force you know it didn't give any expectations that I would do it every day so I was able to give some value and some up some some things that that weren't technically in the game but we kind of wanted to throw in some extra stuff because we had a lot of extra cards that were designed and we had a lot of some lore that was written so we dropped some some extra promo cards and some lore in what we called magical mysteries that weren't tied to any funding and yeah just tried to keep it as simple as possible we we did have actual stretch goals and they were a little more yeah calculated there weren't that many of them they were kind of some basic stuff we just you know we we love magnetic boxes i don't know man magnets are so cool we we want this there isn't a whole lot going you know it's a it's a card game but we wanted just what there is to be good you know we want good cards we want a nice box <laughs> you know so we added a magnetic box card quality upgrade spot uv and um yeah kept it pretty straightforward i'm actually glad that you brought up the the magical mysteries because that was the thing that attracted my eye when i was browsing through your page i'm like wait a second wait a second i know something we we've spoken to the factions battleground people so uh, 
you yeah. need to tell the story of how you collaborated with these other creators to get their likenesses into your game. Oh, yeah, for sure. This is actually really embarrassing because it started off as a purely promotional way, like a strategy to try to fund. To be honest, I was uh, I was meeting with someone, the guy who had given me the advice to like cancel my campaign, to delay it and to lower my funding goal. He's this awesome guy. He lives in Greece. He owns like a really big retail store and he does a lot of licensing. I did a call with him because I wanted to lean into that. Like, okay, you gave me some scary advice, but like, uh, you know, what else do you have to offer? And I'm like, I'm going to launch. But uh, yeah, he gave me just like, I don't know, just a bunch of straight up advice. And uh, one of his things was like, do some kind of collaborations with people like who have live Kickstarters. Yeah, that's a beautiful idea that I, you know, like, I don't know the rules. <laughs> you know, I don't know what people do. And uh, he showed me an example of someone who, who did it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds really cool. So I, I could do that. I could, maybe I could, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cool people that are running campaigns and even like uh, the guys at Factions Battlegrounds, they literally launched the same day as me. <laughs> so I had already been talking to Jason and talking to those guys a little bit. So I sent him a message. I'm like, hey, dude, I got this weird idea. Could I draw you as a card in my game and release it as a promo? And, and uh, you know, I'll give, I'll give you a shout out and put you in an update. And uh, yeah, I had, had also been talking to uh, Zemilio. Yeah, I sent him kind of the same thing. Like, hey, what do you think of this? And so I approached them and they're cool dudes and uh they said sure you know and i kind of just offered to do all the work and you know i'll draw you in as a promo in in my game and we'll uh yeah i'll come with an ability and yeah it was a lot of fun you know i recorded the videos to them i don't know if i've edited them and posted them yet because you know you guys know that's that's, that takes takes a lot of time but i have that but yeah i um contacted them were able to like have their characters designed in their world for the factions guys they're each a certain faction and uh they came they gave me the deeds on like kind of which faction they wanted to be and uh yeah i got some photos of them and uh yeah we uh we i drew the art and uh away we went and it was kind of a fun way to just kind of have a cross promote with each other and help each other out and uh it was a lot of fun and the thing with those cards though is they've their abilities we came up with you know during the campaign and uh they've been less tested than a lot of the other cards so we had to do some last minute just fly by the seat of our pants testing and for Peter's card from Factions Battlegrounds, his ability was something that we'd never done before or worded in that way. And so when you're designing a, a game, you know, for me, I'm not a rules guy. And so writing the rule book for Wizards and Relics was like the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> And uh, it, it's a wording things. Luckily, I have a team, you know, I have some friends that just, you know, they're magic savants and they're writers or they're, you know, they're whatever. They're, they have great input on the wording. But this was one where I polled our audience, like I polled an Instagram and Facebook how to word it, how to get it right. And it just it took a while to nail it down. But uh, yeah, they, they both play pretty fun. They're both pretty OP <laughs> cards. They're, they're really good. But yeah, it, it was just a, a really fun experience that just kind of dove in and kind contacted them and they said yes and so we did it i will say i read a lot of rule books like a lot of rule books and yours is one of the better ones no really super happy with yours whenever i can read a rule book and i'm like i can play this good (laughs) oh my god super clear i didn't have to reread anything i went through it and i'm like i can go oh you have no idea how happy that makes the first time i did a blind play test with my first draft of rules my friend he came back and he didn't even like he couldn't play it (laughs) he couldn't figure it out so I went from that to oh, that's insane. People, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's so great, so great to hear. That was so painful. It's an art form. I mean, writing a good, well laid out rule book is really difficult. Technical writing in that aspect is so hard. And so you know, you buy a game and you open up the box and then you see this rule book and you can't make head or tails of it. It's so frustrating after you've spent all that money. And so when you can see that the person who created the game put in the time and the love and the effort to really explain their own game to the person who just paid the money for it. It's, it's always, it's it's rewarding as, as the purchaser, you know, to, to see that they they really want you to play their game because they explained it well. So like James said, it, it's big when you can get a well-written. So thanks for putting the time in for it. Mm, Oh man. Yeah, you're so right. Yeah, again, that means the world to hear. <laughs> yeah, even some of the established publishers have almost illegible rule books. GMT, I love GMT, but their rule books are like legal documents. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh man, yeah. I've, I've. It's funny how when I look at a bunch of different games as references, a lot of rule books are just 
yeah, they're not that great. Or at least from a designer perspective, there's like not enough spacing. I don't know. They're like not designed really well. And uh, yeah, I am excited. The The final version of the rule book, our actual box is going to be a little wider than like the prototype one you guys got. That guy is kind of chunky. So the rule book is going to be a little bit more pages and a little bit bigger. And so we'll be able to give it some more breathing room and hopefully make it even a little bit more readable and a little easier than it was. But yeah, I definitely sweated bullets over that thing for me many many months <laughs> yeah if you ever want to know how not to write a rule book you need to either read the rule book for robinson crusoe <laughs> yeah that's a good one that's a good one or Cominot. or first martian or first martian oh, first yeah. i could actually i was one of the i i got through and i understood robinson crusoe after reading it the second time and watching two videos <laughs> First March and holy. Oh, that is ah, the, the rule book's unusable. Oh, that's great. I think I downloaded a PDF of the Robinson Crusoe one just for a reference because I've yeah. heard that. But yeah, I haven't played the other ones. Did you guys, I saw your like Christmas uh, pack of games you got. You got Everdell. You just recently posted an Everdell unboxing, right? My wife and I got uh, a manufacturer sent us some games to show us their components and whatever. Um, and one of those games was Everdell. And uh, we, we cracked that baby open, played. It. I, I think I like the rule book. Like that game, the whole thing is just elegantly designed. Yes. Yeah. Have you guys, yeah, if you played it much? And then what do you think about the rule book? Is that a good rule book? I think the rule book, I don't know if anyone else has played it. Nathan might have, but the rule book was awesome. Dan might have too. Uh, I haven't actually had the chance to get that to the table. I, I saw it set up one. <laughs> I like, I like all the components, except for one thing. I'll get to it in a second. <laughs> and I love the rule book. I think it's really well done. I actually, I like how it's uh, divided and it has like little sub things. I like it a lot. Yeah. And I love all the components on the game. The one thing I actually don't like is a tree. Mm. <laughs> Which is yes. sad, but I, I don't like the tree. The tree... It's so hard when you got a table of people for everyone to adequately be able to see the board. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, unless you can sort of like shove everyone in front of it. Yeah. We didn't struggle with that. We only played it two players and then three yeah, players. Two players. Yeah. That would work too. Up to four or it more? definitely goes up to four because I played it four. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see uh, that. Yeah, that's me. tough because it's 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 a beautiful 3D structure. And whenever yeah. you can go upwards, like that's genius. I would never want to figure out how to do, make that happen. But uh, it. it it's a, it's a cool idea, but yeah, yeah, that's interesting. You had that experience where everyone couldn't see it. It looks amazing too. Mm-hmm. It's so. a common complaint on that, and it's also almost completely unnecessary in the game. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's kind of their thing, right? It's their kind of gimmick to like, oh, we're different. Yeah, and- yeah I think it, I think it's actually what they had to. I think they had to do something like that because Starling Games is okay as a size of a company, but I haven't heard of too many Starling Games. So I think they almost had to do something like that to be like, hey, we're here. Yeah, I mean, just the fact that we're talking about. It probably makes it a win. Yeah, right, right? exactly. So if you want to put a giant tree, no such <laughs> press is bad press. Is that the deal? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I thought. That, what did you think of that rule book? It, like, yeah, we just were able to read the rule book and play, and it was, wasn't too stressful. So I yeah. think it was. A if you can up. learn a complex game, one go through the rule book. A good rule book. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Nice art in the rule book helps too. I mean, yeah, and good. Everdell did a really good job at that. Yeah, just breaking up a little bit, give it a lot of space, so you don't have to read a lot on each page. Yeah, and have some art to fill it. That's the other problem. I had with the game, I'd stare at the cards and stuff. Like, this looks so cool. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I don't want to play the card. <laughs> Animal Enchanted Forest. It just, yeah, it really gets you. And there's like a little berries, the little rubber berries. Oh, man, they felt so good. <laughs> I just squeezed them the whole so time. <laughs> Like, this is so cool. Yeah, the, so the little, uh, I don't know, is, I don't think it's foam, or I don't know what it is, but they're so cool. Yeah, some, ah, what material would that be? Like, it's not acrylic, it's some sp- no. it's some spongier plastic, was it? I don't know, it was a basic, like, in each of the things, were just, I was like, phone quality it's like amazing, and I don't even have the ultimate edition, or whatever they call it, so if you want to use those squishy berries in your game, 100% back you on. <laughs> yeah, I gotta figure out how they make those. I guess I do know. Yeah, I guess that'd be long time. <laughs> yeah, it could be uh, fireballs. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Fireballs. <laughs> Oh, man. I don't care. They're squishy. Okay. Yep. So uh, one thing that always gets me, and I've asked a couple times, a couple other people this, and one of the things that sometimes like Kickstarter projects will die afterwards on, and the most dangerous thing about Kickstarter at all seems to be shipping. Mm. I think it was really smart that you did use only for your first one. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Almost <laughs> smart. Almost. I I messed up the campaign. Like, I, I messed up setting up my Kickstarter, to be honest. So yeah, we we're going to we keep it simple. We're going to do USA only. And 
then I'm like, okay, we're going to use a pledge manager. And I've never used a pledge manager before either. Like, all I knew is that my friend, like, GameFound. And like, well, let's use GameFound. It's a good pledge manager. Like, okay, <laughs> like in Realms, it seems cool. It seems legit. And uh, so I, when I set up the campaign, I, I removed shipping, right? So no shipping on Kickstarter. I don't want to get charged, you know, so we're, we're, we're going to charge shipping in the pledge manager, as, as a lot of campaigns do. But what you're supposed to do is keep shipping, the shipping option in Kickstarter, but put it to zero so people can still like enter in their address. And I just removed shipping completely so there was no actual safeguard so the, for yeah. it being USA only. And I just didn't know that. I found out like a few days after from some dude who messaged me in on a Facebook group. I'm like, oh my God, like noob mistake. So I had, I tried to be as clear as possible in my graphics and my wording and on the page. But, and even like me, I'm guilty of, oh, I see something cool. Like, all right, we'll just back it and move yeah. on. And so I have a lot of stragglers, international stragglers. So that was a big hurdle for me to kind of overcome. And yeah. Yeah, we wanted to keep it simple and um it got complicated but yeah. I, honestly it's not too big of a deal we're you know we're gonna get the ce testing so it's more ue friendly and we're gonna you know we're gonna fulfill to these backers that kind of came along for the ride and uh so just a lot of messages and uh working with our fulfillment company to get the prices and so yeah it, it would have been smart <laughs> to, 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 like almost had it uh but you know, it's fun to get the response from different people over the globe that are interested and, and dig it. And so that's that's been OK. We'll we'll figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Your shipping is what killed the glory to Rome. What did they do wrong? Yeah. Or wait, are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it actually literally killed them. Did they like not charge enough or what? What was it? What did they do? Glory to Rome is an older game. It's been a while since it was remotely on Kickstarter, but the the black box edition was published with free international shipping on Kickstarter. Oh man! And the uh, the person responsible for the campaign this close to losing their house. Oh my gosh! Free international shipping. Oh. <laughs> yeah, some countries have a forty five dollar duty tax, so just forty five dollars. Not including shipping. Oh, my gosh. So if anybody from that country ordered it, you're just paying $45. And I think the game the game was like 40 is, bucks. Oh, yeah. man. That's rough. Uh, <laughs> he definitely uh, got nailed really hard for that one. And there's uh, newer Kickstarters that have the same problem, too. So it's, yeah, it's smart not to do free shipping. Yeah. Oh, and, man. That's good to hear. I, you know, I, you want to, like provide as much value to people as possible and i want to you know i see some campaigns that subsidize shipping a lot like man i would i want to do that like that sounds awesome but especially as my first time you know i want to make sure that people get the game right that we actually don't go under so i'm like really conservative and luckily haven't gotten too much too much complaints. I think there was one person who was like, twelve dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, too high. like, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> well, as I, I was looking at it, I'm like, twelve dollars. That's not. I thought that was really low. So I was actually I wore the opposite end. Right. You're my target audience, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, you got you got to pay for boxes. You got all this fun stuff. And, yeah, that's like. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I think, feel at the cusp of like I'm. So I'm I'm getting close to finishing the pledge manager. Well, by the time this airs, it'll be, it'll be open. It'll be open. Uh, but, uh, so yeah, I'm kind of dialing in on the shipping and, you know, shipping prices change and COVID and all sorts of different stuff. And so that's something I'm still kind of like, okay, I'm, we're going to launch it and I'm going to make the, you know, this the shipping is going to be this. And so I'm, I'm, I can still screw it up right now. I can still, <laughs> I can still mess it up. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's good to hear that, to, to kind of play it safe and, yeah, and I only have so many international backers, and I've been communicating with them, and most of them are okay with paying the extra, so hopefully that goes smooth. I think they'll be used to that, too. And honestly, yeah. you're probably cheaper than what most places caught, charge for international shipping. So mm -hmm. just guessing from your U.S. price is probably reasonable for the international. But if you're a U.S. citizen, I will point out, or you live in the United States, I'll put the link down in our uh, comments, but you can still sign up for pre-orders of the game on Kickstarter. So definitely at least check it out. And uh, I would recommend uh, doing the pre-order on it, but that'll be down in the link. So you'll be able to see that and do that if you want. Right on. But, yeah. So when you, uh, one thing I wanted to throw out there real quick too, is when you do your expansion for Wizards and Relics, mm -hmm. one thing I was going to ask, I don't know if you're going to do it, but I was asked, is I really like it when uh, they do the Kickstarter for the expansion, they offer the base game too to be sold. Absolutely. As a bundle. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We're going to be ordering, um, yeah, additional 
we're probably going to manufacture about 3,000 copies, so we'll have some extra in stock to, uh, yeah, to load it up there so people that missed out, yeah, are able to, to get the game too. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool too that you get the buying power that you can get extra stock in. Are you going to try to do some conventions, hopefully this year if they're available, and sell those? Man, that's not on my radar. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't I'm, blame you. I thrive yeah. on the, I thrive on convention life and, and connecting with people and doing that. So I have no problem signing up and hanging out with a bunch of people. So, but it's uh, just not on my brainwave. I guess I am. Yeah. I wanna. I'm. I'm still on the just you know com- trying to get this game manufactured getting the right components so i'm still in the finishing kickstarter brain mode and uh, all i know is i want to ramp up to a, a kickstarter and expansion and and so i, I honestly want to be focused more on a uh, direct consumer off from my website and so i want to i want to focus a little bit more on that so i have not thought about conventions or any other things at all <laughs> yeah so when you're listening to this um we'll be able to take late pledges um on our pledge manager so you can still hop in, get in on this action. Yeah, I mean, if you're like, if you're a gamer like me that wants to, like, I'm a dad. I'm, uh, you know, I have a lot of things that I like to do and create. So I like to play dueling games, but I like to play them with people, with other people, with family or with friends or or uh, or whatnot. So I like a game that that's you can actually play, that's quick to play. Even though, I, you know, I'll play Dominion for four hours straight and just keep on rolling. So, uh, but but on the other hand, I, I like a game that's able to. You have the option to just play a quick a quick round. So yeah, Wizards and Relics. It's a it's a magical dueling game, and uh, you can pre-order it if you miss the the Kickstarter. And yeah, they'll have links. And so yeah, that's that's all I got there. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and uh, it's been an absolute honor to be to be on this podcast. And uh, I just love what you guys do and how you do it. And yeah, you you guys are so good at what you do. And man, I was listening to some episodes, and it just like man, all the games you guys are talking about and the different mechanics and the two player games and the work placement games i like i want to play all these games you just like how you guys talk about stuff it just makes me want to dig in and uh so yeah i just appreciate appreciate being here and uh and all the good work you guys do and i thank you for being on it was a lot of fun Thank you for listening. If you have any feedback for us, feel free to visit us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or Board Game Geek Guild 2989, or our website at tabletopdamingguild.com. And don't forget to like, follow, and or subscribe. Tabletop Gaming Guild is a product of Tabletop Gaming Guild, LLC. All rights reserved. <laughs>